you should all be seeing these slides. I want to jump right into it. Planning without pitfalls, the four biggest tiny mistakes and how to avoid them. Um, right up front, I will say there's going to be a replay. So if you miss anything, you're going to get to go back. Um, it's going to be available for a short time, but you will be able to go back and do a replay. Um, also want to be up front that there is going to be a special offer at the end of the webinar. It's coming at the end. I don't want you to be surprised. This isn't one of those things where I'm going to like tell you my story for 40 minutes and then like all of a sudden I'm going to be pitching some weird thing that you're not expecting. Um, basically, at the end, I'm going to share an offer for anyone who wants to go kind of deeper with me on planning their tiny house builds. Um, and that'll be kind of a special thing at the end. But um, whether or not you take me up on that, I promise you'll get some value out of this session today. Um, so just so that I can kind of know a little bit more about you, um, I'd like to see in the chat, you know, what is your big tiny question? Like what is kind of on the tip of your tongue, the burning question that you're trying to answer next in your tiny house planning journey? Um, I'm also going to share just a little poll, um, just kind of where are you in your tiny house building process? You know, are you just dreaming? Are you actively planning? Are you currently building? Are you already living tiny? I'm going to try to keep this thing going nice and quick. So if you can answer those polls when I bring them up, that would be awesome. Uh, looks like the majority of you are actively planning. That's awesome. I love to catch people who are in the planning phase. Some of you are just dreaming. That's fantastic. Uh, a few of you are currently building. Congratulations. And wow, thank you for, for spending an hour with me because I know every minute counts when you're working on a tiny house. Um, anyone already living tiny? Um, nobody living tiny yet. Um, so let's see, Tamara, water and power decisions. Yep, water on the landscape. Um, Molly's looking for a place to build. Jody's converting a garage and a tiny home, solar power and off grid. That's awesome. Awesome. Trailer is ordered, design almost finished. Congratulations, Colleen. Cool. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm going to try to just give you a lot of value and this is all content that's based out of various guides and courses that I teach. This is what you know I've developed over the years. It's what worked for me or what would have worked for me if I had you know kind of had this information when I was planning and building. Um, so what you're going to get out of today is um, first and foremost, identify the most important pieces of your tiny house. Um, so to do that, we're going to look at the four key questions that you need to answer. Um, those four questions are kind of guiding questions. They're, they're to me, the four most important things that you need to get nailed down before you ever pick up a hammer. Um, and also, I'm going to share the four most costly mistakes. They're kind of interwoven in those, those four key questions. Um, we'll talk about estimating how long your tiny house will take to build. This is something that trips a lot of people up and, um, Hint, most people underestimate how long it's going to take to build. So I'm going to give you kind of a formula and a way to kind of come up with an estimate of how long the build is going to take. Um, we'll talk about how much your tiny house is going to cost. Again, something that is a common pitfall for people. How much is the tiny house going to cost? Um, most people end up going over budget, and I'm going to help you try to account for that as well. Um, we're going to talk about those four most costly tiny house mistakes to avoid. Um, these are things that I'm speaking to you from experience, mistakes that I made, things that really messed up my build or, you know, problems in my tiny house that have continued to haunt me. And I'm wanting for you to avoid those mistakes. So first thing is just like, take a deep breath, stop, you know, turn off the things that ding your cell phone close out of the other tabs. You know, this time is for you and planning. If you come away with one thing, it's like, I need to plan my tiny house more. Planning can make such a huge difference between, you know, a botched project and a successful house. So, you know, you're here to make the plan to make your tiny house happen. And hopefully with me as your guide, you're going to make that plan. Um, and a lot of you are in the planning phase. So that's awesome to know. So, I already asked, where are you in your tiny house building process? And it looks like about 60% of you are actively planning, which is fantastic. Um, 
five of you are currently building and 12 of you are just dreaming. Um, so again, I promise you're all going to get some value out of today and I'm just really excited. This is a brand new webinar for me. I've never given this one live. I just put the finishing touches on it just a day or two ago. So you'll have to bear with me if I, if I stumble a little bit, it's because the content is like fresh out of my brain and I'm just like excited to get it out there. So before we jump in, I just want to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, so hi, I'm Ethan. Um, I got the tiny bug in 2011. I was a few years into kind of a corporate career and I wasn't really that happy with my, with my lifestyle, my work. And I just, you know, I saw tiny houses. I actually saw Tammy Strobel's tiny house and it just clicked for me. I, I knew that this was going to be the thing that was going to allow me to drastically reduce my living expenses so that I could have more freedom to explore entrepreneurship and, and explore working for myself, which is something that I always wanted to do. There was not a ton of information about tiny houses on the internet in 2011 and 2012, um, but I forged ahead full steam and I started on my custom tiny house build in 2012. Now, I thought I was going to be done with the house. Um, I started in June. I thought I was going to be done and in it by September. Um, and that did not happen. I didn't finish building for another 13 short months. Um, 13 months later, I finished my tiny house in 2013. Um, I then spent the next year living in the house, obviously, learning kind of well, what did I do well, what didn't I do well. Um, and then I wrote and published the first edition of Tiny House Decisions, which is um, a guidebook that has helped thousands of people on their planning and their tiny house journeys. Um, in 2015, I published a book called Tiny House Parking, which I know I'm, I got to get more creative with these titles, but helps people figure out how and where to park their tiny house. Um, 2016, I started a private online community called Tiny House Engage. This is basically like a 24 seven online support group for people who are interested or building tiny houses. And then uh, most recently, back in 2018, I launched the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, which is currently the number one tiny house podcast in Apple. And um, I put out a new show uh, for free every Friday. So um, if you are not listeners to the show, I hope you will be after today. So, you know, I never thought that building a tiny house was going to affect my life in such drastic ways. Um, but as you can see, I've been featured kind of all over the place. Um, I was on the homepage of Yahoo in the Boston Globe, um, Design New England, House, Dwell and Design. Um, I've taught courses at this really cool um, design build school right here in Vermont called Yes Tomorrow, which is just a huge honor. Um, I've been at a lot of the tiny house festivals and spoken at them. And it's really, you know, it's been an amazing journey. And, you know, I have no doubt that the tiny house lifestyle for you is going to do things for you that you never thought were possible. Um, it really is. I, I say tiny house journey a lot, and it really is a journey. Um, so here's a couple, a couple shots. Um, this is uh, my house on the cover of kind of a prestigious design magazine, kind of hoity-toity, um, Design New England. And then this is from when I was on the, the homepage of Yahoo, which, you know, you got to take a screenshot of that and just save it. Um, you know, people ask me if I enjoy living tiny, and I totally do. It's, it's awesome. It's beautiful. Um, I'll just show you. I'll share a couple pictures of my setup. Um, so I'm actually renting land. And um, it's very secluded. It's in the woods in Vermont. And it's just, it's as you can see, it's very peaceful. And my wife and I like to joke that we are getting to live like a million dollar lifestyle for, for close to nothing. Um, the town that this tiny house is parked in is kind of a fancy ski town. Um, we would never be able to afford to live there if not for the tiny house. And, you know, tiny houses, you know, Yes, they are affordable housing, and a lot of us focus on that upfront cost. Like, what does the house cost? But what we don't tend to focus on, but what becomes so incredibly present and, and really the driving force behind the tiny house lifestyle is that your cost of living goes down so much. And so your lifestyle changes. Even if you continue making the same amount of money, I didn't take my own advice. My phone just dinged at me. Um, even if you end up, making the same amount of money, 
you're spending less every month. And so that's really, when you hear people talking about the tiny house lifestyle, to me, that's really what, what we are talking about is that ability to live for so much less every month. Um, so here's me in front of the house and, you know, these are just some kind of fun shots. Um, you know, I was just there today kind of packing up for winter, getting prepared. That's something that, you know, I have experience with is living tiny in very cold climates. And um, from based on a few of the, the chats here, uh, it looks like a few of you are living in cold climates as well. Um, and do I plan on building a new tiny house in the future? Rashad, that's a good question. Um, I would say no. I'm pretty happy with the tiny house that I have. Um, we can talk about this maybe at the end. I'm going to try to do some Q&A, but there's a lot of content to get through. So I'm going to just kind of keep on rolling. So everything looks great now, um, but there are definitely things that I would change about my tiny house and especially about some of the systems. So we're talking like heat, hot water. Those are the systems that I would change. And, you know, tiny houses are this amazing opportunity because we were most people were not engaged this engaged in how they build their houses and and even if you are planning on buying your tiny house you know learning about these systems and understanding them will ensure that you get a much better product so um that's why i want to share the things that i would change about my house um what worked and what didn't and you know i'm going to try throughout this presentation to not just talk about my own experience, but to also bring in some of the problems that I've seen other tiny house dwellers um, encountering in the past. So pull out your worksheets, it's planning time. Um, this, is, this is our cat Calvin actually studying the, the tiny house plans as well. We needed, we needed his approval uh, to make sure that the, the layout was acceptable. All right, so what I wanna just have you think about, and if you're willing to share it with me, I would love to know, um, but even if you don't, when you're when you're taking on a big project like this, something that's that's gonna take a long time and be either expensive or difficult, it's so important to to think about what your why is. Like, why are you doing this? And so that way, when you're like six months in and you're like, why the heck am I doing this? This is so hard. It, I could just be like relaxing right now, having a glass of wine, but instead I'm like doing amateur construction or I'm like working with a builder and having to make all these decisions. Like remember what your why is because that's what's going to carry you through. And, you know, before you know it, the build is going to be done and you're going to be living the tiny lifestyle. And like, all the hard work and all the stress and all the struggle of getting it done is going to kind of just be something in the rearview mirror. But in order for us to get from, from here, which is, you know, you're not living the tiny house lifestyle yet. You don't have a tiny house to there, which is you're living the tiny house lifestyle. You're saving so much money per month. You own your own home outright. You're able to travel or you're able to live in multiple places throughout the year, kind of chase the sun. Whatever, whatever it is for you that you want, we need to make you a plan. We need to make you a plan to get there. And so that's basically, we're going to jump into it with these four kind of most important questions that you need to ask yourself. So first of all, we're going to identify the most important pieces of your tiny house. And these are the four questions that we're talking about. So the four key questions that you need to answer. And I apologize if I'm talking fast. I drank a lot of coffee today and I'm just trying to keep it high energy and just really give you as much. I love question number two, um, but we have to get to question number one first. So, okay, four key questions that you need to answer. The first one is how tiny are we talking? And I want to, ooh, I gave you a hint. I'm gonna pull up a poll and I wanna ask you, how tiny are we talking? Um, 100 to 200 square feet, 200 to 300, 3 to 4, 400 plus, or I'm not sure yet. Um, let me know. I see the poll. Oh, I like this. Everybody is is answering much faster now. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. 64% of you have answered. Um, wow, it's a big distribution. So we've got about 20%, 1 to 200 square feet. 
40 percent two to 300 square feet uh 16 percent three to 400 square feet eight percent more than 400 so what i'm going to tell you now is that square footage doesn't matter that was a trick question um there is no in my book, there is no specific square footage that says you're a tiny house or you're not a tiny house. I really like the definition that Jay Schaefer gives. He's kind of one of the founders of the tiny house movement. He started Tumbleweed Tiny Houses back in the day. And a tiny house is a house where all of the space is being used by the inhabitants and there is no wasted space. So if a tiny house for you is 100 square feet, great. If a tiny house for you is 500 square feet, also great. So... How tiny are we talking? My tips are don't get obsessed with square footage. I was just at the Big Mass Tiny House Fest this last weekend. Uh, I was there this morning, actually. And I was kind of, you know, I'm just like people watching and going around to the tiny houses and like listening to people walk in and listen to what they say. And the first thing that comes out of everyone's mouth is, what's the square footage? And then somebody will answer that the person who lives there will say, you know, it's 130 square feet. And they'll go, oh, and we've become like obsessed with these numbers. I mean, people have closets that are 150 square feet. Um, but what you really have to do is think about what it is that you're using the space for and design around those needs. Um, one thing that I see people messing up is they they kind of pick this layout and then they forget that appliances take up a lot of space. Things like a shower. Like your standard small shower pan is three feet by three feet. That's nine square feet. If your floor is only 120 square feet, that's like a little less than 10% of your entire floor is a shower. Um, the toilet, the sink, the range, a table to eat at, a couch to sit on, even your heater, these things all take up space. Um, and then I don't want you to forget about things like the ladder, if you have one, or the staircase. Those take up a lot of space. Um, don't overcompensate. So this is a picture of my tiny house. And I always say that I think I made the kitchen a little bit too big. I really wanted the house to be super livable. I wanted a kitchen that that was easy to cook in, easy to keep clean. And I actually think that there's wasted space in the kitchen. The way I know that is that we have like a couple of kitchen cabinets that are just like become collectors for other non-kitchen items. And so when that starts happening, you know that you've you've misallocated some space. So yeah, don't overcompensate um, on on things that you are like obsessed over, like what you need. Um, this is an exercise that I did not do, but I wish that I had done. It's called tape it out. Um, this is actually a photo from the last yes tomorrow course that I instructed. And um, what we do in that class is um, after we've designed a tiny house for a client. We actually tape it out on the floor with um, in one-to-one -one scale. So this, this is actually the full size of the tiny house. And when you do this exercise, you get a much, much better sense for how big the space is. So in my floor plan, I could go back a couple of slides here. Um, in my original floor plan, there was a chair in this corner. And when I actually got to building the house, I looked in that corner and I realized, oh my gosh, that chair is going to be the tiniest, silliest little chair in the corner. I should just take the couch and move it all the way. Um, had I done this exercise in advance, I might have figured that out. And I actually probably would have changed the layout of how my couch sits in the house based on the fact that I wasn't going to get that chair for that little kind of V-shaped seating area. And so I advise that you tape it out. Um, before we go on to the next one, um, something that I encourage you to do is rather than picking a square footage that you're like, I need this, um, list the things that you want to be able to do in your house. Like I want to be able to take a bath. Okay. So you're gonna need a bathtub or like, I love to sew. So I want a dedicated sewing table and I need two drawers for fabric and, and supplies. Okay, fine. Like no judgment, whatever you want to do you want a ski tuning station in your house great like write that down and then actually make a list and and estimate guesstimate the square footage or the square meterage uh of of each of those things and come up with a total 
let that number be your guide rather than starting at an arbitrary number and saying like my tiny house needs to be this size because it's not a tiny house if it's over 200 square feet. No, that's not a thing. The last thing that I will say, and we're going to go into much more depth uh, about the towing, the on wheels versus on the ground. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about tiny and you're thinking about a house on wheels, there's a direct trade off of towability versus livability. So, you know, the bigger you make the house, the more maybe comfortable it's going to be to be inside it, but the harder it is to tow. And, um, does anybody know what the maximum width you can tow in the United States? You can put it in the chat. You didn't you didn't think that I was going to ask you questions, did you? Eight and a half feet. Kitsy, way to go. Yes, so it's eight and a half feet wide. This changes from state to state, but that is kind of the national average or in most states, that's what it is. And so eight and a half feet is not very wide. And so you get this kind of tunnel effect. And if you go a bit wider, like say 10 feet, that is a much different space. That's a nicer space to be in, in my opinion. However, whenever you go to move that thing, you're going to need to pull a permit. And you might only be able to do it at certain times of the day or with a certain tow vehicle. And so there is a real towability, mobility versus livability thing when we're talking about the size. And that's something that you are gonna need to decide and keep in mind as you plan and design the house. So this is where we get to mistake number one. So mistake number one is that I did not do a good job researching all my appliances. Um, so this thing right here, was anybody planning on using one of these heaters? It's a Newport Dickinson propane heater. Um, so I fell in love with these because I saw them in the original Tumbleweed. And it's actually the first thing that I bought for my tiny house. And um, I found one on eBay. It was a great deal. I picked it up. And I did not do any research about how this thing worked or whether it would work or not. And it turns out that this is designed to heat the cabin of a boat. And it does not have a thermostat, so you can't set the temperature. And to actually get it to turn on, you have to light it manually, like with a lighter or a spark weld tool. And so that didn't work for me at all in Vermont because... Uh, you know, you need to be able to set a temperature and leave. If you turn the heat off and leave for eight hours, your house is going to be frozen when you get home. So that was not great for me. However, what really did it in is that um, these are, even though the instruction manual said that you can vent it out the wall, um, I was having problems with venting. And so what was happening is soot, like the propane was not combusting properly and soot was building up inside of this heater, which was creating actually a dangerous situation. And so my options were to take the stovepipe and go straight up and cut a hole in my roof, which I really didn't want to do, or I was going to have to pick a new heater that would fit in the space that is already there. Um, because in the tiny house, everything is built in. And so it makes it really difficult to change things later. And so I had to then retrofit. I had to cut a new hole in the wall of the tiny house, which I, I love this photo of the leg coming through the hole, and then had to install uh, this new heater. Um, you know, I wasn't able to sell the old one for what I, what I, you know, bought it for. And, you know, this new one costs some money too. So I call this my $2,000 mistake. And, you know, obviously something that could have totally been prevented with a little bit more research. Another appliance that I really didn't do a great job researching was propane refrigerators. Now, propane refrigerators are really common in the RV world. Um, I do not love them for a tiny house, especially in cold weather, because the way they work is that they actually need to be vented to the outside. So if you're looking at this picture on the right and you see those two kind of ugly white vents on the side of the tiny house, those are the vents for this refrigerator. And so in the winter, when it was below zero Fahrenheit, mind you, um, I could just feel the freezing cold air from outside just pouring in around that fridge and onto the floor. And there were some times where the outside air was so cold 
that it would actually cause the entire fridge to freeze up and turn into a freezer. And so it really just was not ideal. And again, it's something that I should have researched and should have kind of followed things to their logical conclusions. Like, okay, this fridge needs vent holes. How am I gonna make sure that those vent holes don't let in a ton of cold? Oh, not to mention the wasps. Uh, wasps loved those vents and were constantly making nests in there and then finding their way into the house. Um, so again, the fridge was another kind of appliance mistake that I made that I could have prevented with more research. And, you know, I'm telling you these things now so that you can do the research or you can just follow my lead and not use them. So because I want to make sure that we stay on time, we're going to go on to the next one. Um, if you do have questions, definitely put them into the chat. Um, I enjoy trying to answer them at the end, and I will try to do some Q&A at the end. Um, so please do put them in there. Um, so. My next question and the next kind of important guiding question here is, are you building or buying? And so again, I'm going to do a little poll. Um, are you going to DIY this thing? Are you can do it mostly yourself with some help. Are you going to hire a builder to build your custom tiny house? Or are you going to plan to do a pre-built or used tiny house? So Carolyn, the propane fridge was because, so I'm not off-grid, but I wanted to build a house that could be easily converted to off-grid. So that's why I went with all propane appliances um, because they use very little electricity. So I did propane stove, hot water heater, heater, and refrigerator. And I've actually had the most trouble with my propane appliances of anything else. In fact, a little bit later, I'm going to tell you about what happened to my water heater. And um, it turns out that I didn't need to be that overzealous about propane appliances. Like you can use an electric fridge and be off grid. You might need a little bit extra solar, but it's not impossible. Um, really just heat is the thing that you're going to need to figure out if you're, if you really want to be off grid. So looks like about 40% of you are going to do it mostly yourself with some professional help. High five. That's exactly what I did. Um, some of you are going to hire a builder. That's awesome. You know, like understand what your strengths are. And, you know, if building isn't one of them, then don't do it. Um, or, you know, buying a pre-built or used tiny house is a great way to get a deal. Um, and yeah, so let's let's jump into this. So time equals money. Um, I, I hear people from time to time say, why are tiny houses so expensive? Like these these darn builders... They're selling tiny houses for, for $60,000, $70,000. Like, why aren't they cheaper? Um, it's time. You know, people need to get paid for their time. And we'll talk about a little bit later how to estimate how long your tiny house is going to take to build. But I'm just trying to give you some averages here of that the average DIY build takes around a year and a half. Um, the average professional build, like when you hire a company to build your tiny house, it's about four months. If you are going with builders, um, avoid bad builders. Now you're going to say like, how do I know in advance if they're a bad builder? Um, there are two episodes of my podcast that I want you to listen to. Um, they are linked from your, your handout, your worksheet on the further uh, reading and listening page. Um, Lindsay Wood tells the story about what happened when her builder went bankrupt and they were planning to build, they were going to have the tiny house built for them and then they had to build it themselves. And she shares a lot of things about what to look for, what went wrong. Also, Jen Baxter got really, um, well, she ended up getting lucky, but um, it, it was scary there for a while. And again, I'll let her tell her story when you listen to those episodes of the podcast. But the three takeaways, if you're going to go with a builder or even like even if you're DIYing your tiny house and you hire somebody to do something, I want you to interview past clients, go with experience. So don't go with somebody who's building a tiny house for the first time. And if it's too good to be true, it, it definitely is. The other day on Instagram, a builder sent me a message and said, hey, Ethan, I'd like to build you a free timber framed tiny house in exchange for you promoting me to your audience. And I'm like, no, like I no, like, cause that's way too good to be true. Nobody's going to build you a house for free. And again, like 
if you get a tiny house builder that's coming in like half the price of everybody else, I would say run. Um, unless you really interview their past clients and you go with experience. Um, and and in the same vein, I want to ask you, and in turn, I want you to ask yourself, you know, what experience are you seeking? Uh, for me, I was not a professional builder. I was an amateur builder. I still am. Um, but building my own house was an experience that I wanted. It was part of it for me. You know, it was going to give me that transition time from the corporate job into whatever else. And it gave me that time to kind of focus on a project and like sink in and work with my hands, which I hadn't done in years because I was just on the computer all the time. And so if you are seeking that experience, then, you know, building your own house is incredibly rewarding and I can't recommend it enough. However, if that is not an experience that you are, looking for i don't don't feel ashamed like you don't have to build your own house in this tiny house movement to have cred like there's nothing there's no purity test of like oh they didn't build their house like that's not a thing and so really it comes down to time time versus money you know if you are working a great job and making good money now it might actually make sense for you to hire someone to build your house like you might make more money per hour at your job, then you would have to pay somebody to build the house. And so it might make sense for you to hire it out. Um, if you have a lot of time, then, you know, nothing beats free labor, but like, don't forget, like all that time that you're going to be building your house is our hours of your life that you are not getting paid for. So even though a tiny house that is built by you is a lot cheaper, it's not cheap in time. There's always, you know, this is the classic chart here. You know, you can have it good, fast, or cheap, and you can only pick two. You know, you can't have all three. And so if you get it fast and cheap, it's going to be low quality. If you get it good and cheap, it's going to take a long time, aka you do it yourself really slow and painstakingly. If you want it good and fast, you're going to have to pay someone. So if you want it good and fast, I can tell you the name of some names of some amazing tiny house builders who can build you a stunning tiny house in three or four months, but you're going to pay for it. So, um, you know, keep this in mind and just, again, think about time versus money. What what is it that you're looking for? So on that vein, my mistake number two is under budgeting. Um, so these are some screenshots. Um, these kind of break my heart. I see them all the time. Um, you know, on tiny house listings, your tiny, tiny home kit, my loss is your gain, you know, like ran out of money, had to move, change jobs. You see them, you see GoFundMes for people who are raising money for tiny houses. Um, tiny houses do not go up in value in general. They, they'll hold their value or go down in value. Um, but an unfinished tiny house is not really worth that much money, you know, it's it's a trailer with some stuff on it. So finishing the house, like the money that you save by living in it is the way that tiny houses make your life amazing. They're not, the house itself isn't like this great investment. So you need to get the house done in order to reap those rewards. And so under budgeting, it can be a problem. And I usually like to tell people like whatever you think it's going to cost. Like if you think you can do it for $10,000, that's impressive. Like I say, add half to that. So if you're thinking 10, try to come up with 15 or at least know what would happen if you had to spend up to 15. You know, if you're budgeting $20,000, what about 30? Like, I'm not trying to like, just tell you like, go up, but running out of money is not a situation that you want to find yourself in. So I want to see you make a plan to know how you're going to get through the build. Um, building piecemeal, building paycheck to paycheck, it's just painstaking um, because you're still paying the high rent, you're still paying the high mortgage of wherever it is that you live, and you're you know, putting a little bit every month into the tiny house when you can. And that's a totally valid way to get it done. Um, but again, the sooner you can get into it, the sooner you're going to start saving money. So let's let's get into that a little bit more, estimating how much your tiny house will cost. And 
hopefully everybody got that handout. Um, I actually, um, I forgot that I can share it here um, in the, um, in the webinar. So in case people didn't get it, you can, you can get it right here. And it looks like a bunch of you are downloading it. So you will find this kind of cost estimator in, in that worksheet. I think it's page two or three. Um, these are just some base costs. Like if your tiny house is good, if you're going to do like 50 to 75% reclaimed and salvaged materials, like $10,000 in materials is actually a reasonable uh, estimate. Now, if you're going to do a lot of salvage and reclaim, that's going to take a lot more time. Um, a little bit less salvage, 25 to 50%. I'm saying about $15,000 in materials. Um, all new materials with a self-build, um, you're looking anywhere from $20,000 to $50,000. And I know that's a big range, but the materials that you choose make a huge difference. And another way to look at it is a cost per foot. So on average, your, your self-built tiny house is about $1,000 to $1,500 per foot. Um, for a professional build, um, we're looking at a range of $40,000 to $100,000. And again, $2,000 to $3,000 per foot. Not per square foot. I'm talking about per like linear foot of your trailer. So like 22-foot tiny house could cost anywhere from $22,000 to $33,000. Did I do that math right? Someone check me on that. I don't, I don't like to do public math usually. Um, the all new materials does include the trailer cost, which is usually about five to $6,000. Thank, thank you, Amy, for that question. That's a good question. Um, so yeah, so use this cost estimator. Um, I will talk about when I, when I tell you more about um, this class that I'm gonna be teaching, um, I do go into much, much more detail on the budgeting, and I, I have some detailed spreadsheets that I can share. Um, but this will get you a great start on, on your cost estimation. Um, so let's talk about how long your tiny house will take to build. Let's like really think about estimating. So I'm just going to flat out say it. 800 to 1,000 hours, do the math. Now, how do you do the math? Um, I have a uh, much more in depth in your worksheet that you just downloaded, a kind of a little formula that you can plug in and use. Um, but basically, what you want to do is some division. Your your elementary school teachers are going to thank me for making you do some division. Um, so, if you are one person who's going to work one eight hour day per week, you can take eight hundred, divide it by that eight hour day, and you'll get a hundred a hundred weeks of working on your house, which is about two years. And that's about what we see for somebody who's working like a day a week. Um, if you're two people working one eight hour day, well then you can cut that hundred in half to 50. And that's about a year. And that's oftentimes what we see when, you know, a couple builds a tiny house together and really stays at it over the costs, over the course of the year. Um, in the planner, I give you kind of some like how to pick in this range, like, if you are doing a tiny house that's 30 feet, not 20, go with the thousand hours. If you are a really novice builder, go with the thousand hours. Like, or if you're like a professional contractor and you're like, yeah, I like remodel houses for breakfast, maybe 800 hours or even less. Um, you might be able to work really efficiently. Um, but in your planning worksheets, there is all that math for you to to kind of work through. So let's talk about the fourth question, which is, what's the climate? No, actually, this is the third question, so I got to keep going. So are you planning on building for a full range of seasons, um, for warm weather only, or are you not sure yet? And I'm loving all the interaction on these, um, these polls, so thank you. Looks like most of you are going with a full range of seasons. Um, about 10% or so are warm weather only, and some people aren't sure yet. And that's fine. You know, if you are on wheels, then you maybe don't have to decide and you can you can go anywhere. Um, so this is where systems get real important. So what's the climate? So here are some of my tips. Heating and cooling. This is gonna this is probably the most, you know, most important thing to make your house livable. Um this is something that I never did. I just kind of was like, I think I need a heater that's this big. Um, use a BTU calculator to determine your heating and cooling needs. I know this sounds really nerdy. Um, 
BTU stands for British Thermal Unit, and it is a it's a measure of heat. Excuse me. And so what you can do, and you can only do this once you have like your plans, like actually planned. You can plug in all the dimensions, like how tall are the walls? How long are they? How high are they? How big are the windows? How insulated are the windows? What kind of insulation? So you plug all this information in, and it will tell you how many BTUs of heat you will need to generate inside the house to keep it at the same temperature, like at 70 degrees or whatever it is that you want to keep your house at, um, based on the differential of the outside. So generally, when you use one of these calculators, you want to think about what your coldest day of the year is, because you don't want to find out on the coldest day of the year that your heater doesn't put out enough BTUs to keep your house warm. Um, don't forget to research the clearance needs of your heater. So I used this word before. Clearance is how much space there needs to be around the thing for it to be safe. Things like wood stoves require a lot of clearance, a lot of space between them and other combustibles. Um, my propane heater around the sides is fine, but you can't have anything above it for many, many feet because it gets very, very hot on top. Um, and then the third tip on heating and cooling is combine fuels when possible. So, for example, if you're already going to be running propane lines for your heat, you can use propane for a whole lot of other things, which I'm going to tell you in a minute why I don't necessarily love propane, but um, you can combine those fuels. Like if you are going to go with a mini split heat pump, which I'm a huge fan of, that runs on electricity. Like, okay, you can do an electric stove then. You can do an electric hot water heater, and then you don't have to use propane at all because you've combined fuels. Insulation. Um, we could do an entire hour. We could do an entire day on insulation, but I will tell you three important things. Not all products are created equal, um, even within like rigid foam. You know, those like it looks like styrofoam boards. There are so many different grades and types of that foam that have a big range in R value. R value is kind of a measure of how much heat the insulation can resist letting through. Um, another really important thing is to pay attention to vapor. So water is the silent killer in buildings. Water is what destroys buildings. And when you heat a building, you are heating it with your body, you're breathing, you're cooking, you're creating a moist, warm environment. And when that moist warm air travels through the wall what happens anyone know yes condensation exactly tamara so again not to give you like a whole lesson on on thermodynamics i don't know if this is thermodynamics physics um basically you need to prevent water from uh, condensing inside of your walls, certain insulations require you to install what's called a vapor barrier. And this vapor barrier prevents vapor from going through your wall. Certain insulations like spray foam allow, uh, act as their own vapor barrier. You don't need to install one. So something to pay attention to. Finally, air sealing. You've got to, building a structure that's airtight is also very important in terms of the livability. Um, and I'm getting slow on time, so I got to keep going. So the last thing that I want to talk about in this climate is ventilation. Ventilation is one of the most overlooked systems in your tiny house, and it's so critically important. Um, having poor ventilation can cause some of the biggest problems. Um, and don't forget about getting fresh air in. Most people are obsessed with venting the poo smells and the shower and the cooking smells out. You need to also get air in, which is why I recommend something called an HRV, a uh, heat recovery ventilator. Um, here's a picture of what happens when you don't put a vapor barrier in your roof. Uh, you don't vent your roof. This is Ella Don Jenkins. Um, after just a few months of living in her tiny house, she found mold and had to tear out her entire ceiling, all the insulation to put in a vapor barrier. And actually, no, she didn't put in a vapor barrier. She vented her roof, which is another way of accounting for that. And so you can see on the right here, that is mold that had already grown in her ceiling. Don't, don't be Ella. I mean, she's wonderful, but don't be her. Um, 
Here's another picture. This is uh, a tiny house that my friend Shorty is renovating. And this is mold growing from where behind the cabinets were. Again, moist environment, not good ventilation, you get mold. Um, so this is really important to research and understand. This one is my biggest mistake. And I'm calling it not thinking systems. Photo on the left, what's wrong with that picture? Photo on the right, what's wrong with that? Okay, so on the left, this is a picture from inside my tiny house. Inside my tiny house, that water is frozen. Yes, I ran out of propane. Um, my The way my propane system was designed was not redundant. It was not good at recovering from running out of propane and changing over. And so on January 1st of 2018, during the polar vortex, my house froze. And on the right here is a close-up picture of the inside of my hot water heater. And you can see that ice has broken through this pipe and there were several more breakages inside. So I basically blew up my hot water heater, $1,200 hot water heater, and um, also had to replace some pipes in the wall because I did not do a good job thinking through my propane system and how it would respond when there was a power outage. Very important. Last important question is, are you doing it on wheels or are you ground bound? And this one is big because um, it's, a, it's a big question. Um, there are huge benefits to being on wheels. Um, obviously, you get to own your own home without owning land. Um, if you get in trouble, you can just move. And it is the least expensive option. This is the most affordable way. And this is, this is really why tiny houses are so affordable other than the size. It's that they disconnect the land from the house. So all you have to buy is the house. The cons here, the negatives, is that tiny houses are often seen as temporary structures or on wheels. Um, so you can very easily and quickly run into zoning and code issues. Um, so this is this is the big question. You know, are they RVs? Are they temporary structures? Are they vehicles? I would like to say no, but when you're on wheels, sometimes that is the category that you get lumped into. The other thing we already talked about, which is that you're going to be limited both in the shape, so like the height and the width of your tiny house, but also the weight. So like if you've been dreaming about those tile floors and granite countertops, probably not in your tiny house because those are heavy. If you do the ground bound, um, it's usually the legal option um, because you're going to have to follow the building code and get an inspection and go through the whole process. Um, there's much fewer limits. Um, they're easier to heat and cool and hook up because you can build the walls a lot thicker and put the appropriate amount of insulation in them. Um, obviously, you're not going to get mobility. You're probably going to need to go through the legal process, and sometimes that's much more expensive, especially when you get into um, building on a foundation and having like a concrete cement uh, foundation poured. The hybrid option is skids. Um, so this is often overlooked, but there's some permanence and some mobility. A structure on skids can be moved, um, and it combines some of the benefits and disadvantages. Again, I've given you further reading and listening to do on your worksheets um, to some articles that I've written about uh, building on the ground versus building on skids versus trailers. So my mistake number four is being a purist. You know, whether, you know, a tiny house on wheels might not be right for you if you're thinking that you want to travel all the time. I might steer you in the direction of a van or a school bus. Or, you know, a groundbound tiny house might really be a much better choice for you. Um, don't come to this with a preconceived notion of what it is that you're going to end up in. You know, go through the planning process, go through the discovery, and really figure out what it is that you need. Um, because doing that is going to allow you to build a house that actually works for you. So I'm curious. Based on what we've talked about, you know, what what are the three most important things that you want to research next? I'd love to see it, see it in the chat. Just like what are you, you know, have you learned anything so far that you're like, I need to look into that and I need to do that next? Zips. Okay. Tiny house on a foundation as a home base, class B. Cool. I like seeing these coming in local, cold, air quality, moisture, trailers, power, waste, location, systems. Awesome. These are great. I'm really proud of you guys. Like, this is such so fun so far. And so everything that I did wrong, 
I hope you figured out that I could have prevented it with more research. And basically, since I built my tiny house, I have just continued to do that research and continued to be a resource. And so this is a point in the in the webinar where I want to kind of give you an offer and say that if you want to go deeper on this with me, kind of as your teacher, I have put together a new class. This is brand new. You can be part of the inaugural class. Um, and it's called Tiny House Decisions Live. And so it's a five-week interactive course to help you plan your tiny house. And so I'll jump right in and just tell you about what Tiny House Decisions Live is. Um, it's based on my, my guide, Tiny House Decisions, which has been completely rewritten in a second edition and expanded. Um, so during week one, you'll get to know people in the class. It's limited to just 15. So, um, you know, if you get in, great. If not, you know, maybe in the future. But um, I'll kind of give you a lay of the land, tell you about all the the, intro, the all the materials. And then most of important is to meet each other because we're going to be, this is actually a live class. Like, this isn't just something that I'm selling for you to download. Like, and yes, there are downloads, but we're going to meet each other. We're going to help each other. We're going to like work on our tiny house plans together. So week one is about meeting each other. Um, week two is all about these big decisions. Like, is a tiny house even right for you? What about the legal issues where you are? Um, should you build it yourself or hire help? You know, should you work with a pre-built shell, which is a, an option that wasn't even available to me, um, on wheels, ground bound, you know, you can read the screen just like I can. But these are the big foundational decisions that you need to answer before you start. Week three is when we go into all of these systems. You know, when we're done, you'll know exactly what appliances make up each system and you will have picked your appliances and you'll understand how they work together. So heat, hot water, water, toilets, electrical, refrigeration, ventilation. You know, if these are things that you are wondering about, then these are things that, that I want to help you with in this class. Um, week four is the construction decision. So this is where we'll talk about you know, all these different building systems, SIPs versus stick frame versus advanced frame versus metal frame. There are so many options and real pros and cons to each one. Um, subfloor, sheathing, roofing materials, insulation. I know that you have like probably seen all these things, but, um, you know, even if you're buying a tiny house, it's important to understand these things. Um, as your teacher, I have already built a tiny house and there will be some special guests in the class to kind of tell you about their experiences as well. Um, and then finally for week five, um, after construction is complete, there's a lot that goes into moving a tiny house, hooking it up to utilities, preparing a parking site. I will give you kind of advance heads up that I did not do a good job preparing my tiny house parking site. And so I really want to like help people not make the same mistakes I did there, dealing with pests and tiny house security. And so um, here's just some testimonials from people who um, who have been through it. You know, Kim says, I'm so much more prepared than I did. You know, having thought through the building process, it's getting so much smoother. Um, tiny house decisions gives you invaluable information about every decision you'll need to make before ever starting on your tiny house endeavor. Um, Kim, again, you're the best thing that's ever happened with the tiny houses. I know. I love it. Um, you know, again, like for me, this, this point is all about helping people get through this. And that's why I'm so excited about, about this class that I've put together. So there's going to obviously be a deal. Um, so no, I'm not paying Kim. <laughs> um, so this will be the inaugural class. So um, I'm doing a first launch $150 discount. Um, you'll be the first to receive the brand new Tiny House Decisions Guide. And then for everyone who signs up for the class, um, you will get kind of a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me um, anytime in the future. So you, know, you don't have to use it during the class. But again, um, I do offer consulting. Um, and so that's $149 dollar value right there. And so the regular price for this class is going to be $4.99. And the special webinar deal is um, for this first launch is just $3.49. Um, enrollment closes and the price is going to go up. So um, I want to 
make sure that, well, first of all, see if this is right for you. Um, but if you do want to go deeper on planning your tiny house and really come up with a plan, um, I would love to help you do that and kind of be your guide. I'm going to put a link um, up here on the page for you to check out. Um, and I hope you do. And the the URL is um, thetinyhouse.net slash live. 